that's okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. It's now time to hand over to our first presenter today, which is James Rimmer from the University of St Andrews. And then it will be Coralie Hunt from St Andrews as well, Liam Godwin from UHI, and then Jack Sheehy from Harriet Watt. So again, please submit your questions in the Q&A box. And that's everything from me. Over to you, James. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, let's just share this screen here. Is that coming through okay? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, um, so hi, uh, I'm James Rimmer. I'm a PhD student at the Sediment Ecology Research Group at St Andrews. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about an aspect of my research, which is uh, looking at the how we evaluate the cumulative uh, impacts of multiple stresses on estuarine biofilms. So I'm going to break that down into a couple of different areas. Why uh, we should care about estuarine biofilm and also what it is. Uh, how we can investigate it, uh, why multiple stresses matter for those who might not do research in this area, and talking about some of my upcoming work and current work. So just to break it down, uh, biofilm in, in general terms um, is uh, any assemblage of uh, microorganisms which are growing in mutual association and in association with either a, a two-dimensional surface uh, or a three-dimensional structure. Uh, and my focus is on uh, microbenthos, which are unicellular organisms which inhabit uh, the spaces between uh, sediment particles. In particular, the microphytobenthos, which is the photosynthetic uh, constituents of that assemblage, which in sufficient biomass in the intertidal can be seen as a, a green sort of brown discoloration of the sediment, as you can see in the upper right panel there. Now, what's quite interesting about biofilms is um, the exudation of uh, these extracellular polymeric substances, or EPS. Uh, essentially, biofilms form uh, a matrix, uh, which is formed of uh, mostly proteins, carbohydrates, uh, as well as lipids and nucleic acids. And the mass of this matrix may indeed exceed the mass of the cells which produce it. Uh, and this matrix has many roles, uh, including, but not limited to, uh, adhesion, uh, which I'll discuss a little bit more on the next slide. Uh, as well as other processes such as uh, enzymatic activity, gene flow, uh, as well as offering a, a measure of environmental protection. Now the microphytobenthos have uh, several key ecological roles. They're important uh, primary producers in the unvegetated uh, intertidal flats, um, and they are grazed upon by uh, various invertebrates, including ragworms, uh, amphipods such as corophium, uh, which in turn, of course, are consumed by higher predators. Uh, perhaps the more interesting aspect is uh, this exudation process in which uh, these uh, EPS substances are, are released. And a byproduct of uh, this process is the binding together more tightly of sediment grains, uh, which results in uh, stabilization and increased uh, resistance to erosion. Um, so therefore we have this sort of ecosystem engineering process going on uh, where uh, this mudflat habitat uh, is stabilized. Uh, so that's just a little bit of background uh, to uh, estuarine biofilm. And uh, just to go into multiple stresses a little bit, th there are various different frameworks for, for understanding multiple stresses. The idea is that you have two or more uh, potential sources of stress, uh, which can have uh, effects which are either greater than or less than the sum of their parts. What do I mean by that? Well, if you have uh, stressor A plus stressor B, if the impact that you see is greater than their, the sum of their individual effects, you have a synergism, uh, and the opposite of that would be an antagonism. So just a, a classic example, uh, some kind of uh, environmental pollutant which has an effect which I'm representing by the killing of free fish, um, and uh, ultraviolet radiation uh, in isolation having its own impact. When you combine the two, uh, they have an impact which is greater than the sum of their parts as a result of the ultraviolet radiation increasing the toxicity uh, of this pollutant. And there are various different mechanisms in which uh, interactions can arise, uh, including uh, reaching a tipping, tipping point, overwhelming uh, an organism's uh, physiological uh, defense mechanism. Antagonisms can come about in uh, various different ways. For example, uh, shared resilience pathways to stress, so a response to one stressor, naturally resulting in uh, increased uh, defense to a secondary stressor or for example, by the neutralization of the effect of one stressor by the, the presence of another. And these responses can occur at various different biological levels. That could be from the cellular to the physiological organism all right up to the, the ecosystem. And there's no guarantee that the responses at each of these different levels uh, to the same kinds of stress 
will be identical. Now, in the case of estuarine systems, they lie naturally at the interface between the terrestrial, the freshwater, uh, marine habitats, and of course the atmosphere. And so there is a potentially very great range of stresses um, which can arise uh, in these environments. Now, some of the methods that we can use to uh, evaluate the response of biofilm to stress uh, we include uh, pulse amplitude modulation, which is uh, a non-invasive technique we can use to uh, examine, for example, the uh, electron transport rate of uh, the biofilm. We can deploy the cohesive strength meter, the CSM, in that second image there, which fires a, a jet of water at sediment surface, and we can use that to uh, determine at what point uh, the critical erosion threshold has been reached, which again is a proxy for uh, the degree of biological stabilization which has taken place. We can also more invasively look at uh, the chlorophyll content of sediment, uh, as well as directly uh, quantify the EPS, which is, is present in the sediment. Other methods we can look at are looking at the community composition of uh, diatoms. They have uh, unique shapes, so they're comparatively easy to identify compared to some microorganisms. Uh, and we've also had access to the uh, scanning electron microscope uh, to produce interesting pictures. Now, what's quite interesting uh, about the approach that we're using at CERG is that we've constructed in-house um, these tidal mesocosms. Um, so one aspect of uh, diatoms uh, is that they move on a, a tidal rhythm um, and they also uh, vertically migrate in response to uh, environmental conditions. Uh, so we built a system which uh, using a, a Raspberry Pi a single board computer controls a series of stepper motors which uh, raise and lower mesocosms which have been filled with sediment and inoculated with uh, biofilm. Uh, into and out of seawater, so effectively simulating a tide. And this way we can very quickly uh, test a range of different conditions uh, in a sort of fully factorial experimental design. Uh, from using this, we can of course then uh, measure impacts uh, on the various different responses that we've uh, examined. Uh, and in combination with looking at uh, environmental and, and uh, physical uh, drivers of uh, these responses in the field, we can start to generate predictions about how uh, the biofilm in its natural environment will respond to stress uh, and test those predictions. Uh, one of the things that's noticeable is that uh, in the field, responses tend to be somewhat muted compared to what we detect in mesocosms. Uh, so just because we see a very, very strong response to stress in the laboratory environment doesn't necessarily mean that we'll see such a, a strong response in the field. So just to go over some of the, the sort of research questions that I'm looking at um, and will be continuing to look at now and, and during my PhD, um, looking for um, whether interactions, these synergisms and uh, antagonisms do actually occur at relevant uh, concentrations of these stresses. Um, from my point of view, there's not a huge amount of point in completely inundating a system with unrealistic levels of a stressor if that's not actually likely to occur uh, in the watershed of interest. Um, I think it's much more interesting to be able to try and look at uh, a reasonable environmental level uh, and again we can then test for interactions by using this uh, factorial experimental design. Something we've looked at uh, relatively recently is uh, some different temporal factors and how they might affect the cumulative stress response. So for example whether or not the order in which uh, stressor exposure has occurred uh, has an impact. Uh, and in some recent experiments, we found that uh, exposure first uh, to a herbicide uh, before titanium uh, dioxide nanoparticles had a more negative impact on the photosynthetic response uh, or the photosynthetic uh, condition of biofilm than the other way around. Uh, so there's various different factors which, which may have uh, un difficult to predict impacts essentially. Some of the other questions I'm going to be looking at uh, during the course of my project are to the extent to which uh, antagonisms and synergisms dominate or whether additive effects are more common and perhaps more importantly whether there is a difference between what we detect in the lab versus what we find in the field because again mesocosms are a great system for coming up with hypotheses uh, and generating uh, research questions. But if 
we don't actually, if we can't actually use them to make realistic predictions because stress is much more intense in that confined system, uh, then we've got a bit of a problem. Uh, another question is, to what extent uh, the biological responses are consistent at the, the different levels of stress, so uh, whether the uh, individual response of different organisms is, is the same as the overall ecological response. Uh, another aspect is looking at which stresses are likely to have the, the biggest impacts in these systems, and also um, whether or not they can be mitigated. Uh, there are a range of global change drivers related to climate change, we can't mitigate those directly at the local, local level, usually, um, but we might be able to identify other factors which are likely to synergistically interact with these and mitigate those instead. Um, so that's about it for um, my talk. What I would like to do, um, and this is where I'm going to get Hannah to help me out, is ask you quite a broad question, um, which I realise the premise is quite uh, subjective and up for debate and I'm not necessarily looking for a, a true answer here, but I'm just interested to know from you uh, what you believe to be the greatest source of stress affecting estuarine ecosystems uh, in Scotland or in the UK as a whole. Um, so I'll give you a few few seconds to sort of have a vote on that. Um, this is mostly just for my own interest, just to see what people think. And I, I do realise that it is quite a subjective question. So for all our attendees, you should have a little pop-up box with uh, James's question and you will have the option to choose one of those options. So we'll be closing in just a couple of seconds. So get your vote in very soon. And these are the results. Very interesting indeed. Um, I think I'm probably inclined to agree there though. Uh... I think that's, that is very interesting. Thank you all very much indeed for listening to me and I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks. We now move on to our second presenter who is Coralie Hunt at the University of St Andrews. Coralie, are you there? There we go. You. Yep. Hi. Just um, setting up here. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, you're good to go. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so I'm Coralie, I'm a PhD student at the University of St Andrews and I'm going to talk to you today about my research which is using sound to map sedimentary blue carbon. So a quick background into marine sediments and, and why, why we care about them. The marine environment um, has a significant role within the carbon cycle and coastal environments are important sinks of carbon dioxide. The oceans have absorbed, or estimated to have, have absorbed about 30% of anthropogenically produced CO2 since the Industrial Revolution. Now you'll see on my, on my slides that um, I've put blue in brackets there. Um, strictly speaking, blue carbon is related to three coastal vegetated habitats, um, those being mangroves, salt marsh and seagrass meadows, which are very efficient at actively sequestering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere via photosynthesis. Now, this is very different um, to sediments, which um, A, are not in contact with the atmosphere, um, but still receive organic matter that is associated with sediments that fall through the water column, column and end up on the seabed. And over, um, over time, these sediments build up and effectively um, store buried carbon that then turn into these carbon stores over very long time scales, We're talking over millennia, thousands of years. And through um, over these time scales, sediments are actually providing a climate regulation service, um, essentially by removing that carbon as it's being buried from the carbon cycle preventing it from being remineralized 
uh, back into CO2 um, as long as there's no uh, nothing to kind of disturb those 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 sediments. Carbon accounting is becoming um, an increasingly important activity uh, given international commitments such as the Paris Agreement um, and understanding our, our total baseline carbon stocks is, is really important for management, has significance to management purposes. For maritime nations, um, marine carbon stocks can actually form the majority or form a very significant part of total carbon stocks. And Scotland, uh, this is particularly relevant to Scotland, which has about six times more seabed area than it does land area. Uh, you'll notice from that um, BGS folk sediment map that the, the sediments in, around on the on Scottish shelf are quite variable and sediment type has um, a relationship with carbon storage. And so it's really important to understand the spatial di distribution of those sediments and also the carbon that's associated with them. And in doing so, by improving our spatial mapping of sedimentary carbon, we can um, calculate more accurate carbon stock estimates uh, and can also inform more effective seabed management strategies for more carbon rich areas, for instance. So I'm going to just talk through a method that I've um, developed um, based in Loch Rearan, which is a sea lock on the west coast of Scotland. Uh, recent research has shown that Scottish fjords are significant carbon stores due to their proximity to land and their closely over deep in basins, which essentially act as sediment traps. However, the spatial distribution of that carbon is not well constrained, and the assumption has generally been that sediments in these sea lock areas are, are homogeneous. So we've used Loch Rearan. Uh, to develop a methodology that uses multi-beam data, so it's multi-beam echo sounder data, to map that surface sedimentary carbon store. And this is based on known relationships between sediment grain size and uh, multi-beam data, specifically the acoustic backscatter element of that. So um, multi-beam is used generally in, or more generally in seabed seabed habitat mapping because of this relationship. So we see um, higher intensity returns from the multi-beam if we've got a, a higher coarser group. Um, sediment grain size also has a relationship with organic carbon and organic carbon has a tendency to associate with the finer sediments. So using those two relationships, we were interested to see whether we could see a relationship directly between the acoustic backscatter and organic carbon. So a research question was, can we use acoustic backscatter data as a proxy for organic carbon in, um, on the seabed? And the method we've developed incorporates three main elements. The first being multi-beam echo sounder, which is essentially um, sound waves being emitted from a sonar which travel through the water column and hit the seabed. And on hitting the seabed, they're reflected back um, in a manner that tells us something about the substrate type of the seabed. We also used uh, opportunistic towed camera images that were collected within Loch Rearin as well. And um, the images that were essentially used as a guide to give us a visual impression and validate that acoustic we've you know, been able to interpret. And finally, we collected um, grab samples to sample the sediments in uh, areas across the uh, across Loch Ruin. And this, um, these samples we used to quantify the sediment characteristics, particularly grain size, and also the carbon content within those areas. So this is, uh, well, the question is, what does the seabed sound like? And this is a picture of Loch Rearan seabed based on the interaction um, between sound waves and the sediments. And what we can see from the grayscale there is that it's not actually a homogenous um, sediment as perhaps was once um, presupposed. The, what we're seeing is the darker areas are representing soft muddy sediments uh, due to the low intensity return signal that we see. Um, and the lighter areas are representing harder, coarser substrates uh, due to the higher intensity return. And if you think about um, bouncing a ball onto the ground, if you're bouncing it in mud, you're going to have a much 
a different, you're going to have a much different bounce response um, as if you had bounced a ball on something a lot harder like rock or gravel. And that's a similar principle that we see with um, echo sounder data here. So what does the seabed look like? Um, we, there, here are some choice images from those uh, video toes and they basically confirm that the seabed is quite uh, variable within Loch Rearin and um, confirms the picture really of the acoustics that we were getting. So uh, with these images, we made a qualitative assessment based on the folk classification scheme of what sediments we thought we could see. And these results in combination with the multi-beam uh, data were used to inform a ground truthing strategy. And that um, ground truthing strategy is um, based on, um, I carried out an unsupervised classification on the multi-beam data. Um, and seven classes were output as the optimal number of classes that, that the patterns that could be picked up from that classification. And this more or less um, agreed with the classification that we'd done with the images as well. So we were fairly confident that if we were collecting samples from within each of those class areas, we should be getting a representative set of samples. So 28 grabs were collected in total and um, we did particle size analysis on the sediments we collected and also elemental an analysis to get the carbon values. And um, what you can see in this ternary diagram here, uh, the, the main point is that the dots are colored according to the class that you can see in the map on the left hand side. And, and what it's showing us is the composition of the sediments that we collected. And generally, the um, classes, class dots or samples are clustered um, quite well by class, which tells us that um, the classification did a relatively good job at identifying the broad sediment types based on the multi-beam data. So we're fairly confident that we got a, a decent representation of the sediments in Loch Rearn. So the question we had was whether backscatter was a good proxy for organic carbon. So I'm just going to jump straight to those results, um, which you can see in the plot on the left-hand side. A backscatter value was extracted at each grab, grab sample location. And we see um, a fairly strong linear relationship between organic carbon content within the sediments and the mean backscatter. And this was a function of sediment type. So organic carbon is more strongly associated with those finer sediments, um, lower grain sizes, which also have a lower backscatter return signal um, due to absorbing that energy rather than reflecting it. So we use the that um, relationship to calculate a continuous map of sedimentary organic carbon, which you can see on the right hand side. And, and that highlights um, the organic rich areas in, in the yellows and oranges um, and has a, um, uh, enables us to be able to think about more effective management strategies now that we can see where these kind of hot spots of organic matter are. We also calculated a stock um, using that map and the dry bulk densities of the sediments. And we um, estimated that there's roughly about 12,000 tons of organic carbon in the top 10 centimeters of, of the sediment, um, which equates to about 45 uh, tons of carbon dioxide. So the next stage in my project is to think about how we might extend this method using multi-beam data. And I want to extend it onto the shelf, which is a very different setting, a different background to see if um, we can still see patterns between uh, acoustic backscatter data, sediment type and organic carbon to help to refine some of the, the spatial maps that have been produced looking at carbon and sediments. Um, so I've used It'll leverage some existing multi-beam backscatter data collected by the UKHO, which uh, maps the bathymetry of the UK. And uh, through a process of elimination, I've selected the um, a, a survey, survey data that was collected on the east coast of Scotland in uh, the Moray Firth area uh, in 2007. 
and um, I've had the opportunity to ground truth that, that, date, um, that, that area as well. So I'm now in a position, having collected those samples in the process of analysing them, to test whether this method works in a different setting and have a number of my own samples collected. And I've also managed to collect some secondary data within the area as well to help um, increase that sample density. So my research questions um, for this area and this backscatter are, does backscatter show a relationship with sedimentary organic carbon in this area? If not, what other variables are the best predictors for the distribution of sedimentary organic carbon? And finally, can we calculate a surface stock of organic carbon across that survey area and can that help inform um, management? And just to, to finish off with some pretty pictures, um, I was fortunate to be given a place on the Scotia last summer. Um, Marine Scotland and Scottish Government are um, very supportive of blue carbon research, Scotland being you know, a maritime nation. And um, we had 10 days of near perfect weather, traveling most of the Scottish coastline, um, which really just beautiful um, and a, a hugely exciting opportunity for a lot of PhD students who were aboard collecting samples for their projects. Um, and generally had a, I had a successful sampling trip and I'm looking forward to um, starting to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Great, thank you very much Coralie, that was a good talk and now we are moving on to Liam Godwin from UHI with his talk now. You have to unmute yourself, Liam. There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, cool. My name is Liam Godwin. Uh, I'm studying at the UHI, and I'll be today running you through what my PhD will be about, which is about more or less uh, land use within the flow country and how that interacts with aquatic ecology in the rivers, and especially the ones that bear salmon. Uh, so I'll start by describing what the flow country is, if any of you aren't familiar. It's basically this area of uh, peatland in uh, Sutherland and Caithness at the very top of Scotland. Um, it's very large, it's about 200,000 hectares, uh, and a hectare is about the size of a rugby pitch. Um, and it's just a huge area of blanket moss. And if you're wondering why I'm talking about peatland in uh, a marine uh, talk is because of the rivers which bear salmon uh, and who live in these rivers and their uh, they're young, they're their young, um, have salmon reds where they breed, uh, which are these two uh, samples that these men have caught. Uh, I'm mainly studying the Furvo, Hallidale, and Langwell catchments, uh, which are six, eight, and 12 on that map. And the land use in these areas has always been quite significant. Um, hi, hi Liam, can you just speak up a little bit? You're, you're very quiet at the minute. I can. Oh, I'll go closer to the microphone as well. Excellent, uh, thank the land use in these catchments um, has gone on for a long time. Uh, we've been here since the Neolithic. Uh, at least that's what our settlements uh, would show. And uh, recently in medieval times, that's probably when our influence on the actual aquatic ecology probably had to have an effect because of um, agriculture and mills, which would have had dams to uh, channel water that would have stopped uh, salmon from coming up the rivers to breed. Um, and then most recently we've had the clearances uh, to do large scale sheep farming, We've had management for deer and grouse. Uh, then in World War II, we had a lot of subsidies for upland agriculture, which had caused a lot of the peatland to be drained. Uh, and then we've also most recently had tax breaks and subsidies for drainage and forestry in the 1970s. Um, and then in the 21st and 20th century, we've been having uh, peatland restoration and wind farms, 
And my PhD is mainly studying the effects of drainage and forestry and the restoration from these sites and how peatland restoration is impacting uh, the wildlife living in the rivers. Uh, and so, so far from existing literature, we know that <clears throat> alterating, altering the catchment uh, or either for foresting the peatlands, which shouldn't usually have trees on them, with non-native conifers, and for draining the peatlands, you tend to alter the flow regime, um, which increases flooding and low flow events because water is more easily moved off of the catchments, which tend to make them more flashy in these already quite flashy systems. Um, you increase erosion from the dry peat and the fast water movement, which increases sedimentation in the rivers. Uh, and then you alter the nutrient cycling, um, which had all sorts of problems for aquatic ecology, especially when you start looking at uh, plants and phytophyton. Uh, you increase the metal concentration sometimes, uh, and aluminium and iron can be quite harmful to salmon. Um, and then also drain peatlands produce much more darker discolored water, uh, which is going to be problematic if there's no riparian shading because the river warms up faster. And you also have a problem where it interferes with uh, visual feeders. Uh, and conifer plantations also increase acidification in many rivers. Uh, so here's my study design. Uh, I'm comparing between near natural bog, which tends to look like this. Uh, you have drain peatment, peatlands, where you have um, these kind of uh, drains dug in them. Uh, and then restoring those, you have drain blocked, where you can have all sorts of different dams that block them intermittently in the old channel, either made of peat, like on the bottom, or you introduce some kind of material like the plastic pylons uh, on the top. You also have a forested peatland, uh, and they can be quite extensive, like this. Uh, and we have forestry removal, where the forestry is removed by machinery and people, and then you tend to put in drain blocks as well, because often they're quite well drained to grow the trees initially. Uh, I'm sampling up mostly in the upper catchments and headwaters, uh, where a lot of this um, land use has changed. And then we're also sampling downstream uh, to see how the water quality changes as more and more of the catchment starts to influence it. Because salmon don't tend to be in these upper catchment reaches. Um, in Cape Ness and Sutherland, you tend to have trout dominating up there. Uh, but once you start to get into about two meter wide rivers uh, or streams, that's when salmon start coming up for feeding or for making reds. Uh, I'm working with the Low Country River Trust, uh, who do have electrofishing data, uh, where they do salmon uh, sampling. And then I can look at those sites to see how, if there's been changes in the salmon after large activities of uh, peatland restoration, uh, and how uh, salmon populations are changing over time in these areas, and seeing if there's any correlation with um, land use in these catchments. And we're also looking at invertebrates, because invertebrates are important as uh, indicating water quality, as well as um, the importance of salmon feeding when they uh, are growing in the rivers. Uh, and so far, I think we've had short term, uh, which appears to be that you significantly disturb the peat, uh, especially if machinery come in. Um, and you have to, especially forestry removal is quite detrimental to the peatland, but it's already quite significantly problematic. Uh, but usually during these periods, um, the land managers put in things to stop this, like you tend to put in these little nets in the stream to stop the large quantity of sediment that will run into the rivers. Uh, and then there's also good evidence over time from other studies looking at these streams that uh, sediment, nutrients, metal leaching, and most water quality measurements improve, or at least go to more the near natural bog. Uh, and then invertebrate ecology has also been shown to improve in streams uh, in the stored peatland. Um, but the problem is, um, how do these impacts really impact, really affect downstream? Are these impacts felt where salmon are? Um, or are there any problems that are occurring with restoration which we've ignored, such as the increased sedimentation on a short term? Maybe we should put some more of the keep these nets in for longer following restoration, uh, as well as we also need more evidence for how um, 
this restoration is impacting aquatic ecology in the flow countries because there's still not that many studies being done. And that's it. And I'm probably under time. No worries, Liam. Thank you very much for your talk. And our next talk and our last talk is Jack Sheehy from Heriot Watt University. For any of our attendees, uh, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we'll be working through those after. Um, hello, so um, yep, I'm Jack Sheehy. I'm doing a PhD in blue carbon in Orkney. Uh, and I'm here today to talk about policy context and ecological economics. Uh, I'm also funded through the SuperDTP um, School and through the Natural Environment Research Council. And I obviously do this research through Heritage Watt University up at ICIT in Orkney. So a bit of background about myself. Um, that's me um, diving. Uh, my background is mostly marine, bio marine, uh, marine biology, but also marine renewable energy. And in between academic life, I used to work as a dive instructor um, in consultancy. And more recently, I've been helping out with economics and development appraisal with the university. Um, so I kind of want to use various different skill sets to kind of steer the aims of my research. So the first thing I thought I'd do with blue carbon audit was to figure out exactly what blue carbon is. Um, so, um, it was first introduced over 10 years ago um, for its role in binding carbon in healthy oceans. And it was introduced alongside these other carbon colours, such as brown, black and green carbon. And it's most closely related to green carbon. Um, so this is carbon stored through natural processes uh, and predominantly photosynthesis in the world. And in some ways, blue carbon is seen as green carbon but in the marine environment. And for this reason, it's kind of taken over a biological slant, which may or may not be justified. Um, but this text here is from the, this first paper where the term was first introduced. And it makes special reference to mangroves, marshes, and seagrasses, but also mentions the marine sediments too. But you will notice it actually doesn't define what blue carbon is. It just kind of gives some indication of what it could be. Um, and this has created a fair bit of debate, um, even to this day. So in some literature, uh, mangrove, salt marsh, and seagrass is defined as blue carbon, or blue carbon is defined as these three habitats. Um, but there's also these other habitats and species which could later be included in blue carbon policy frameworks. Um, some um, are precluded for data gaps. Um, some are, can't seen as biological, so they're kind of more geological, which aren't quite seen as blue carbon. Um, others, uh, we don't have enough data or this calcification effects, which kind of complicate the carbon flux calculations. But the main two criteria are that blue carbon needs to have large scale greenhouse gas emissions reductions and also long term storage. Um, dependent on how you define long term storage is another issue, though. But blue carbon is, is introduced in terms of a climate change and mitigation tool. So, in terms of climate change, I want to scoop back out for a second back to climate change economics. Um, I won't go into this in too much detail because I don't really have time, um, but this relates to optimal levels of pollution. And the main one I want to, the main line I want you to look at is the social cost of carbon here. And, and basically as we continue to pollute the atmosphere and release carbon into it, um, the cost and damage of that carbon increases. Um, and this actually increases the value then of carbon or carbon sequestration. So in terms of typical economic and financial analysis, climate change impacts are seen as a far future impact, so 30, 40, 50 years time in the future, and therefore we can discount them. But another way of looking at that is to value blue carbon resources now, and by doing so, we can get that value and then they're seen as an appreciating asset which will increase in value over time. So it's another kind of way to engage stakeholders with financial means. And this is very much seen in the post-2015 development agenda of the UK, which comprises the Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development Goals, and Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, and this is very much seen as getting away from the top-down approach of the Kyoto Protocol, um, in terms of climate change mitigation targets, um, to more of a bottom-up and sustainable development um, approach. Um, NDCs, are, NDCs, they are nationally determined contributions, um, and they are now effectively um, our climate change targets for countries. 
Um, and with these new market mechanisms, which I think there might be an issue there, but we can come back later, um, these have a potential um, to reduce costs by half um, and by $250 billion per year by 2030. Um, and in conjunction with this bottom-up approach, um, we also want to look at the other values of blue carbon. And like I said, blue carbon has this kind of biological aspect to it. So on the left here, uh, these are various funding routes for climate change mitigation for blue carbon. But there's also funding routes available through biodiversity targets um, in green and purple here. Um, um, and in conjunction with this, these co-benefits of biodiversity values, such as storm protection and fisheries co-benefits, are in some ways more tangible and more relevant and immediately accessible to stakeholders which to engage them with. So how does this work in practice? Um, so this might work through regional auditing and uh, marine spatial planning processes, um, also through buyer preferences. So again, in terms of bottom-up engagement, if we buy, say, fish food now, uh, we might demand that if we do, um, it has to be sustainably sourced and has no bycatch. And that's kind of an example of how, of how buyer preference um, affects um, top-down policy. Another example, or the most kind of interesting one, I think now is insurance. So if you have a coastal community um, and you have mapped blue carbon resources, so this is a map of blue carbon or biological blue carbon resources in Orkney, uh, you might be able to have a community that then includes this in MSP processes. And then if they then want to get insurance to protect them from climate change and fisheries collapses, um, and the risk of these will be potentially greater in the future, um, those values of those blue carbon resources um, acknowledged, quantified and mapped and protected can then be translated through reduced insurance premiums for local communities and stakeholders. So again, it's about engaging stakeholders through financial incentives to kind of get them engaged with their blue carbon support and effectively wider climate change mitigation goals. Uh, and this creates what's called um, total economic value. So we're not just valuing blue carbon for carbon sequestration, but also the biodiversity. Um, and storm protection and fisheries code benefits. So with more research into this, um, this can then potentially expand the scope of blue carbon to not just salt, um, mangroves, salt grass, uh, salt marsh and seagrass, but also into other habitats and species which might be more relevant in Scotland. And the point of all of this again is in this bottom-up engagement approach, we can translate these values uh, through financial means to local stakeholders, um, kind of get them to engage in it um, and to appreciate that their consumer preferences and decisions um, can also drive societal change. So responsibility is not just from top-down policy, but also from a bottom-up approach too. And in this way, I think blue carbon is very much a kind of a microcosm of the wider climate change mitigation issue in terms of we need greater public education and outreach and engagement of stakeholders at all levels of the value chain um, for it to be effective. Um, my next uh, research um, questions and routes are to kind of map and quantify, get some sediment cores of blue carbon. Um, this might be a little bit affected by COVID, um, we'll see, um, but that's kind of where I am at now in terms of translating those values um, to local stakeholders and using that to kind of drive the societal change and climate change mitigation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Jack, for your talk. Um, we are now going to be entering the live Q&A session with our speakers. Uh, so uh, to all our attendees, if you have any questions that you would last, like to ask anyone, please uh, type it in the Q&A box. I should also uh, do a shout out right now to uh, one of our panelists, Lois Calder here. Uh, she's the Dean from the Mass Grad School. So if you have any questions actually directed for the Mass Grad School, please check out the chat where she's put her email in and you'll be able to contact her there as well. So uh, for our uh, panelists, so Liam, Coralie, James, uh, can you turn on your cameras uh, so people can see you so we work through some questions. Uh, we've got our first question which is for Coralie um, and has been submitted and it asks, do you think there would be a good way to apply the use of acoustic data or maybe infrared data in intertidal as a means of accessing shallow areas which aren't actually covered uh, in your map and that might be more accessible at low tide by foot than by boat. 
Um, thanks for the question. Uh, it's an interesting one. Um, I'm not entirely sure, actually, if there's a minimum depth for multi-beam echo standards, standards to be effective. So I think that would be one consideration. Um, infrared data, I'm not entirely sure how that works. So um, I, I can't answer for that, but there may, may be something in using remote sensing data to get those intertidal habitats or to be able to maybe classify um, areas of remote sense data into certain habitats that you could then go and sample and um, get a, a feel for what the carbon associated with those habitats is to, as you say, improve the scope of that map. Um, yes, but I, I don't know specifically uh, what, yeah, whether acoustic systems would work in the intertidal area, whether it might be too shallow for them. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't be <laughs> more specific on that. No, that's fine. That actually built, built a much nicer question than I was going to ask myself about, you know, the, the image that you showed of where you were able to use the backscatter. Uh, I was going to ask, how do you think you can capture data from those shallower areas? But I think you kind of summed that up quite well. Um, our next question from Sylvia. Uh, it isn't specifically named who it's for, so I hope someone understands what the acronym is, which is <laughs> how is SCC quantified and is it uh, quantified only on primary impact level of conglomeration of cascading effects as well? So uh, that's open to whoever thinks it's for them. Okay, Jack. <laughs> Pretty sure it's for me. Um, so yeah, how is it quantified? Um, it's a bit tricky, so it's kind of based on integration assessment models for climate change uh, impacts, um, but it's also based on social discount rates too, which is a whole other conversation in terms of how that's judged. Um, in the UK, we use 3.5, but there's arguments for 10% or lower or higher. It depends how you value um, it for economic analysis, whether you view it as a future impact and cost, or if you view it now as an appreciating asset, it can really affect how you might use that. Um, we don't really use them too much now in the UK or worldwide. We kind of try to get around that through carbon markets, um, but that's kind of how it's quantified. It's, it's, and the reason it's not really used anymore is because there's so much uncertainty with the modelings and market uncertainty and future climate change uh, emissions. Um, so it's it's a it's a multiple uh, thing which we don't really use too much. But that's kind of answers that I think or hope. Um, I should ask, uh, what, what was the acronym SCC stand for? Oh, sorry. Um, that stands for Social Cost of Carbon. Um, and it's used here in conjunction with um, MAC, which is Marginal Abatement Cost. Um, but that's a whole other economics. Yeah, you don't want to get into that now, I don't think. <laughs> Our next question is also for you, Jack, uh, and it's from Hannah asking, do you know of any carbon crediting programs ongoing in the UK similar to mangrove credits overseas? A question uh, that she often gets at conferences is about offsetting travel within the UK using UK based crediting, and she has yet to come across one. Um, I think I'd probably ask the same question back to you. Um... <laughs> I, I know, I think in the UK, not too much um, because we don't have these kind of great stores. There might be something with salt marsh um, at the moment, but I don't know. In terms of uh, the deep project, um, that's kind of another route in terms of some of the values of blue carbon resources translated through other means. Um, but in terms of just pure carbon offsetting, um, I think in the UK, we're, we're kind of in terms of the blue carbon form, we're trying to introduce that now, but it's not established yet. The same as insurance markets too, they're, they're seen as a viable route and pathway for climate change mitigation with blue carbon, um, but it's not actually established how these mechanics, uh, mechanics actually work just yet. All right, thank you for that very in-depth question. Uh, all attendees, please submit any other questions that you have uh, in the incoming box. Um, another question for Jack, goodness me, uh, asking, is it possible to make a more accurate multivariant economic and ecological model? Um, well, I'd hope so. Um, <laughs> essentially, the as we go on and we kind of, um, we have more research into blue carbon, we have more research into the economic impacts of that, and we have more data to play around with. Um, so that can all feed into these economic and ecological models. Uh, and what we're trying to do now with sustainable development goals is try to get this bottom triple, line, uh, triple bottom line of economic, ecological and social value. Um, so this is again, is, is bottom up engagement. So essentially, yes, but in terms of how we are, in terms of our, uh, 
human approaches to it, which uh, that's a poor, poorly worded, but essentially we don't appreciate impacts until we get them. Uh, and for climate change impacts, we won't have them until 30 years. We kind of get a little bit of that now, um, but it kind of means there's a big disconnect between those impacts and the economic impacts of those two. Um, so what we're trying to do is bring them together, um, but it's quite hard to obviously convince someone to spend you know, some money now to protect it in the future. So the other way to look at it is to then think of it as an investment now and more money in the future for them, if we can do that. It's just kind of how you view it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood. And I was just kind of wondering when you were saying, you know, it's a little bit more uh, less tangible uh, climate change as an impact rate that will happen in the future compared to now. That kind of made me think about that poll that James had in his talk. Actually, you know, people say climate change was one of the lower options that was chosen by participants whilst uh, agricultural pollution. You know, we see it. We see it now. And I was wondering, you know, that's a bit it's easier for us to understand the impacts that are happening on our estuaries with that rather than climate change. And I was just wondering, James, do you have an idea? Like, do you think that's potentially a thought process like that? I think, I mean, the thing with climate change is it's ubiquitous. It's a, a global driver that affects every system. And so, you know, on a, on a local level, local factors may be immediately more significant. Um, but of course, it's, it's when you add it all together across every single system that's being affected by this not exactly single ubiquitous force but in any case um you know i i'm not an economist but i can imagine it makes a lot more sense to mitigate against the the single uh, or you know the, the overarching global driver um but that's that's probably a question for someone else <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Our next question has come in and it's from Ter uh, Teresa. Uh, and I think it's probably for Jack again, but maybe Carly, you'll be able to jump in because it is about Blue Card. Uh, are, there, uh, are there possibilities of clear integration across blue carbon projects in Scotland, or maybe it's already happening? So just any examples that you know of? Um, for me, uh, there's different types of blue carbon, um, as we kind of discussed, and there's maybe expansion of that scope. Um, and this kind of links back to Coley's research with sedimentary blue carbon too. So we know that blue, it depends how you define blue carbon, but essentially um, in terms of blue carbon form, there's all this research around different potential routes of blue carbon and funding for that and that kind of integration. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm not sure how to answer that entirely. I mean, I think I borrow, I research um, so I kind of, I imagine I'd probably come across Coralie Hunt's uh, research in a bit and there's other Blue Carbon Forum research happening too, and that very much informs what I'm doing. But in terms of a, a clear goal integration wise, uh, the policy, it's still a little bit uncertain yet because Blue Carbon is not accepted in NDCs. Well, it's not accepted by the IPCC just yet, um, but that's, it depends you define Blue Carbon as well. Um, I don't know if Coralie you have anything to add to that. Um, I, I would say um, in terms of, uh, well, blue carbon within the UK, Scotland is certainly uh, seems um, is, is a lot more integrated in the sense that we, the government are very supportive of blue carbon research and understanding blue carbon stocks within Scotland. And um, as a result of that has actually set up the Scottish Blue Carbon Forum. And there is a website for that, which details all the current research projects uh, going on within Scotland. And that's um, the, the universities who are involved, the PhD students that have been funded through that forum and the links to masks um, as well. So that would be one, if you were interested in learning more about what's going on in Scotland, that would be one place to look. Um, and then as Jack says, we're, we have, um, there have been meetings, uh, I think this was before Jack started, but there was a, a, a blue carbon meeting uh, organized last summer where blue carbon researchers from within the UK and further afield came to discuss um, what's going on within the community. So th there does seem to be integration across projects and uh, yeah, the website's a good place to start. That's great. And uh... We can always include that link on the YouTube video of this talk afterwards as well. Uh, we don't have any other questions at the minute to work through. So if anyone has any burning questions that they want to ask, please type it in really soon. Um, but at the minute, I would just like to say thank you to 
all four of you for speaking today uh, for our attendees who weren't aware. These are four PhD students from uh, the Mass Grad School and also the Super DTP program. Uh, and so we did a quick fire talk to kind of showcase some of the work that's happening within our grad schools. Um, that's everything for today. I think I can't see any other questions coming in. So thank you all for uh, presenting today and thank you to all our attendees who joined us. Thank you. Thank you. For anyone who is still with us at the minute, I would just like to advertise the upcoming remainder talks that we have for the Mass webinar series. We are ending on the 2nd of September. Uh, we're going to give ourselves a bit of a break before the Mass ASM. So if you see any of these talks that interest you, please sign up using the same registration link that you have used before. I'm aware that the registration website is a little out of date. Unfortunately, I can't update it without having to ask everyone who's registered to re-register. So even though there might be a little differences between what you see here on the website, what you see on the screen is the most up-to-date information. So please sign up uh, and these talks happen every Wednesday at 1 p.m. So you'll be able to get your marine science fix prior to our mass annual science meeting, which is happening from the 5th to the 9th of October. A lot more information is going to be coming out about that in the next coming weeks. So keep an eye on our Twitter, LinkedIn. And if you're not already, sign up to our mailing lists, which can be found on the mass website at www.mass.ac.uk. See you next week.